So governments have chosen to lower interest rates and borrow money to stimulate these two sectors to avoid the economy becoming very anemic. What that's done is it's caused very rapid increases in asset prices, let's say home prices, which mm -hmm. has caused this dramatic affordability issue for the middle class unable to afford uh, the average house. So what that's doing is it's causing a delay in household formation. We have this growing affordability issue, which is preventing most people from uh, achieving those household formation uh, goals. It's delaying um, the ability for, for people to start families, uh, and it's causing a very rapid decline in the overall birth rate, which is negatively reinforcing all of these demographic issues. Eric, great to meet you and welcome to the show. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Well, I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel and the content that you produce. And I went down a bit of a demographic uh, deep dive and I probably don't get out as much as I should, but uh, I find it so fascinating because when you look at a population, you can really sort of predict the future. And we've been hearing more and more about how the middle class is sort of eroding around us. And demographics are so interlinked into that, that I wanted to have this conversation with you to show how demographics, economic growth, federal reserve policy are potentially all linked and how they may all be leading towards the same outcome. Mm. So to start off here, how would you define demographics and how would you define the middle class for the audience and myself? Yeah. So uh, I'm glad we're able to have this conversation because so many people are focused on what's going to happen over the next three months or next six months. Um, demographics are incredibly important to analyze, but they really are slow moving like a glacier. We're talking things that will impact the economy over five, 10, 20 years. So these conversations get overlooked a lot because we tend to ignore what's going to happen slowly over the long term to try and either find a solution or make a prediction about what's going to happen over the next couple of months. And uh, it's not often that we get to have these conversations about how economic growth, demographics, and governmental policy are all uh, interconnected and feeding on each other. So uh, I'm glad we'll be able to unpack this. Just to start, um, demographics can mean a lot of things, but for the purpose of this conversation and the research that I do, demographics mainly refers to the growth rate of a country's population and the age composition of a country's population. And if you had to narrow it down to one single variable or one chart that you could produce, I'd say the most informative uh, variable or chart that you could produce would be to plot the growth rate of a country's 25 to 64 year old population. Because as I'm sure we'll, we'll unpack here, um, you follow a very predictable pattern of consumption and income and the amount of taxes that you contribute to society uh, very predictably based on the, um, the age cohort that you fall in. Um, you tend to increase your consumption as you rise through your 20s, 30s, and 40s, and then you decrease your consumption in your 60s, 70s, and 80s as an example with quite a, a high degree of predictability. So that 25 to 64 year old bracket is extremely important for an economy because they're predominantly the people who are working. They're predominantly the people who are earning income and consuming. They're predominantly the people who are paying taxes. Uh, and um, for, for, for lack of a better term, they are the people that care for the people who are in the younger bracket and the older bracket. So um, how lopsided a population gets in terms of how many older people they have relative to that prime age bucket is, is very important because um, you know, you, you, you'll ultimately have to suck a lot of resources in terms of time and money from your really vibrant population to care for your older population. And this is a problem that we're seeing in all the major developed nations. Okay. So that defines demographics for us. And I want to tie in the middle class as well. So how would you define the middle class for myself and the listeners? So it's a, uh, 
it's a it's a it's a tough definition because you know the middle class for for what we're talking about here is so broad it's mm-hmm. it's sort of uh and as these problems have progressed it's sort of morphed from the lower class to the middle class to everybody outside of maybe the top 10% certainly the top 5% so you know i would i would say to you that maybe the middle class is people that are in the bottom 90% of net worth that sounds a little funny but the point that i'm trying mm-hmm. to make here is that these problems that we're going to discuss have sort of chewed their way from the lower net worth uh parts of the population all through um people who are in the 90 to 95th percentile of the population even those people are starting to become affected by some of these issues so for the purposes of this conversation um i would just think of it as a um a spectrum and in terms of uh, net worth. And um, these problems will disproportionately impact uh, people on the lower end of that spectrum. Uh, and depending on how advanced the country is in terms of these demographic problems, it could bleed all the way up towards the 90 and 95th percentile, which in a lot of cases is what we're seeing in the United States today. Okay. And what has changed and what is the what is the current state of demographics in the United States and the developed world? And how has it changed over the last 50 years, say? And 50 years doesn't have to be a static number. I'm just kind of pulling that out. But how have yeah, you seen the trends no, change over that's, time? That's perfect. So I'll start with the United States. So let's, again, just use our one variable of this 25 to 64-year-old uh, population and how vibrant that, that population is. We hear a lot of misconceptions about demographics. And it really depends on uh, maybe what products you're selling or what your profession is and sort of how you want to paint the numbers. But Mm -hmm. the facts are that um, from 1960 um, or really the 1950s until the early 1970s, we saw uh, the country had about 1% growth in this 25 to 64 year old population, which is pretty good, pretty healthy growth. Um, Mm -hmm. As the baby boom generation uh, who were predominantly born in the late 40s and uh, in some cases early 50s, as those people moved into their 25 and 30 year old bracket, that pushes us towards the 1970s. So from the 1970s through the 1980s, those 20 years, there was an absolute explosion in the growth rate of that 25 to 64 year old population rising to two and a half percent per year. So the economy was growing two and a half percent per year just because of the population, um, which is quite remarkable. And that was obviously extremely fast pace of population growth relative to our history and most other developed nations. Since the uh, 1980s, it's been a very steady downward trend in the growth rate of this population, falling from two and a half to two, one and a half, one, 0.5. Uh, And now in the United States, over the next 10 or 20 years, we're expecting that that 25 to 64 year old population cohort is going to grow about 0.2 percent per year. So some people take that measure and they say there's more more people in their prime age population. Therefore, that's good. But Mm -hmm. the more appropriate way to analyze it is based on the growth rates, because you know, if you had if you were adding 200 people per year and now you're adding 100 people per year, you're still adding people, but at a uh, lesser rate. And therefore, when you translate it to the economic impact, there will be a positive impact, but it'll be less positive than it was in years prior. So that's sort of the backdrop for the um, for the United States. And when we look at um, Europe, China and Japan, the other major developed nations, Um, they all collectively have a catastrophic uh, demographic problem because over the next 20 or 30 years, they're projected, all of those countries individually are all projected to lose about 20% of that prime age uh, demographic. Uh, There's not really a time other than wars or plagues where you've seen uh, a developed nation or really any nation lose uh, a fifth of their prime age population. Um, so it, it remains to be seen what types of impacts 
uh, those changes will have on those economies, but it's unlikely to be an overly positive impact because um, it's causing uh, contractions in the amount of available workers in these countries. It's eroding the tax base, which is putting pressures on the federal governments. So Mm -hmm. a whole host of problems that will uh, ultimately plague the United States, uh, but is much more advanced in Europe, China, and Japan. Right. And over the same time frame, what have we seen happen to the middle class as far as share of the total population and also share of societal net worth? Mm -hmm. So uh, in most of these nations, as a share of the total population, this prime age bucket is falling as a share of the total. And the 65 and over is rapidly rising as a share of the total population. So that's going to be very burdensome for all uh, major nations because most developed nations have um, uh, some sorts of retirement programs at the government level, which uh, heavily disincentivizes work after 65 because you're receiving some sort of income, which lessens your need to, um, to, to, to remain in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see, um, this older uh, bracket of people leave the workforce, stop producing, stop earning income, stop contributing taxes, uh, but then also uh, pull resources from the government uh, at, at a time when the government was supposed to have a lot of those resources available. But we all know that over the years, those those resources have, for the most part, been spent in, in other places. So that's the... the um, the dynamics in terms of the relative relative share over that time as well we're seeing the uh the net worth of that middle class or even the net worth of uh you know the bottom 90 percent uh is falling as a share of the total population so uh we're seeing this trend where you're having an erosion of demographics at the same time that uh the wealth is being concentrated in uh, fewer and fewer hands and this mm-hmm. is the um, the really critical link that I think is massively overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. So can we break down on a tangible level for myself and the audience? How do demographics really affect the real economy? Because I think we'll get into this in a bit because the financialization of everything um, in the economy around us, but there is a real economy. And how do demographics really affect that in a positive or negative way? So. Um, Going back to one of the things that we mentioned in the early part of the conversation is that um, when you look at the uh, age cohorts, so you look at people that are under 25, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, uh, and you can plot their uh, consumption patterns over the years. And those consumption patterns follow an extraordinarily predictable path. Um, When you're about 55, that's generally when your total consumption peaks and then starts to drop off. And of course, that uh, contributes negatively to society if you're consuming less uh, because the economy has what we call a circular flow, which means that uh, what you consume is equal to what you produce. What you produce is equal to what you earn. What you earn is tied into how much employment there is. So that circular flow Mm -hmm. is obviously weakened uh, as the population gets older and each individual person is consuming less, producing less, working less and earning less. Um, But more importantly is that the economy is really driven by a very narrow subset of consumption, what I call the engine of the economy. And the engine of the economy is comprised of mostly consuming housing and consuming durable goods or vehicles. Uh, And the reason that those are so important is because, one, they're relatively large ticket items. uh, And number two, they have what we call a very high multiplier effect, meaning that um, when you buy a house, there's a lot of secondary and tertiary effects that uh, positively impact the economy. You need to furnish the house, which drives retail sales. You need to maintain the house and the lawn and the driveway, which drives uh, services consumption. So there's a lot of 
positive ripple effects that come through uh, a very vibrant young population that's consuming a lot of housing related services and a lot of vehicles. It propels a manufacturing process. It propels a lot of employment in secondary industries that service the houses and the cars. Um, so it's a very important part of total consumption. Uh, but what's interesting is that the consumption of housing and vehicles peaks even earlier than total consumption. Uh, the consumption of these high-powered goods tends to peak in the 45-year-old range, so about 10 years earlier than uh, the total level of consumption. So mm. as an economy gets older and older, what you see is that you have less natural demand for housing and vehicles, which puts a depressive effect on the economy. Uh, and as the economy starts to experience this negative effect of lower housing related consumption and lower manufacturing related needs, um, there is a very strong impulse from governments and central authorities to artificially stimulate the demand for those goods because those sectors are what the, the engine of the economy. And if that engine is sputtering, then the entire economy is very weak. The best example of this would be that after the 2008 recession, there was a very significant and prolonged period of very anemic housing and vehicle consumption because we were uh, experiencing the, the washout of the recession. Um, and that's one of the primary reasons why from 2010 through 2020, we had the weakest uh, expansion in the post-World War II era. And that's mm -hmm. also the reason why after the COVID recession, we had one of the most explosive recoveries ever because we very specifically stimulated housing and durable goods through lowering interest rates and sending uh, money directly to people to consume on, on durable goods. So um, it's it's very important for uh, a population to have that younger age uh, uh, growth rate because it propels this housing and vehicle related consumption. And then when you don't have that population backing, governments are forced to or not forced, but incentivized to artificially stimulate those sectors, which usually comes in the form of lower interest rates and higher debt levels, which then compounds the problem. Right. Right. And that was going to be my next question is, do you think the policymakers are aware of demographics and the demographic trends um, or are they just focused on economic growth and trying to stimulate that as an aggregate? Right. I think I think they're aware of it. I'm sure they've all seen the charts and they know the projections going forward, but I don't think mm -hmm. they understand how intertwined it is and how much their policies are impacting um, the, the demographic uh, profile. Um, you know, now we're really getting to the crux of the issue. And if I was to lay it out, what I would say is that as the population of the major developed nations has been getting older and we have less natural demand for housing and, and durable goods, governments have resorted to lowering interest rates and borrowing money to artificially stimulate uh, housing and goods. You see that very dominantly in China. And to a lesser extent, but quite severe in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. What that does is it causes a short term boost uh, in those assets and specifically those asset prices because it fuels uh, some level of speculation. Uh, and then those asset prices are, are beneficiaries of that stimulus and lower interest rates, while the wages aren't uh, as much of a beneficiary because Lowering interest rates doesn't increase your wage, but lowering interest rates mechanically does increase the value of most real estate properties. So governments have chosen to lower interest rates and borrow money to stimulate these two sectors to avoid the economy becoming very anemic. What that's done is it's caused very rapid increases in asset prices, let's say home prices, which mm -hmm. has caused this dramatic affordability issue for the middle class unable to afford uh, the average house. Uh, the average house is trading uh, significantly above average income over, over long periods of time. 
So what that's doing is it's causing a delay in household formation. It's much more difficult for people to start a family in an apartment versus a house. So if you were able to afford a house in your 20s, 30 or 40 years ago, you're able mm-hmm. to move forward on that household formation process, have kids, and keep propelling this demographic uh, spiral in the upward direction. But what's happening is because of these policy choices and because they're stimulating the asset price through lower interest rates, but not stimulating the actual underlying economy, uh, we have this growing affordability issue, which is preventing most people from uh, achieving those household formation uh, goals. It's delaying um, the ability for for people to start families, uh, and it's causing a very rapid decline in the overall birth rate, which is negatively reinforcing all of these demographic issues. And it's not unique to the United States. We have very good evidence of this because as countries have pursued these policies of rapidly stimulating their real estate sectors to avoid the anemic growth that's genuinely there from their demographics, we've seen a complete collapse in populations independent. China, Japan, Italy, Spain, Portugal, United States, you name it. We're all experiencing the same problems and they're manifestations of the exact same problem. You have evidence of this also in terms of the timing because Japan was the poster child for this demographic bust. They're the ones that are leading the curve. They're 10 or 15 years ahead of everybody. Mm -hmm. And their real estate bubble was also 10 or 15 years ahead of everybody in the late 1980s, early 1990s. They went to zero interest rates after that bubble burst in the uh, in the mid 1990s, and they're still there today. So that just yeah. goes to show you how how significant these problems are. But I, I really want to stress that that dynamic between uh, lower interest rates, stimulation, uh, and and increased debt, driving up asset prices, causing a really significant um, uh, shift in affordability, delaying household formation, causing a decline in birth rates. And then that reinforcing a population decline is really the mechanism that's at work here. It moves incredibly slowly, which is why nobody feels the need to, to tackle the problem. But the, the really big issue is that even if they decided to tackle the problem today, it takes 10 or 15 years to change your demographic, sometimes longer. So a lot of these problems are set in stone and there's really no good solution for them. Yeah. And you nailed it. That's kind of the light bulb moment that I had going over your uh, work over the weekend was you think these are isolated problems, but you realize how nuanced they are and how they're all feeding back into each other. And you're like, oh my God, like if you actually want to solve this and actually create true demand in the economy, what sort of restructuring or what has to happen? And like you said, these are not near-term fixes where, you know, we can make a policy change today in a year from now, we're going to see the impact of that. It's going to be something that's going to have to take structural, right. almost reform and right. not going to be something we're going to see for 10 or 15 years. So my question for you, Eric, is um, with policymakers reducing interest rates, incentivizing people to take on debt and inflating asset prices, was that always the goal or is that an unintended unintended consequence of trying to create this artificial demand within the economy? I, I think it's, um, I would say it's case by case. I don't want to say every country did it intentionally or not intentionally, but uh, we have some uncomfortable facts that we have to deal with, which is that the um, one of the main proponents and early proponents of these policies was Ben Bernanke in the 2008 crisis, sort of um, bringing quantitative easing and these uh, more asset focused policies to to the forefront, and he very specifically said that they were doing it to cause a wealth effect. Uh, the concept being that if they inflated asset prices, uh, the beneficiaries of those increases would spend more money because they have this newfound net worth. And then that would drive that virtuous cycle, which I was trying to explain of how housing and vehicles propels a, um, a, a, a positive economic cycle. So that was the theory or the logic. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it, it didn't obviously work because most of those assets are concentrated in very few hands. So it wasn't able to create 
a, a, a more robust economic environment. And then even still, um, the academic research on the wealth effect is uh, very limited, um, it, it, meaning that it's really not conclusive that driving asset prices significantly higher radically improves overall levels of consumption. Um, you know, we had quite elevated levels of asset price growth from 2010 through 2020, uh, and we did not have very robust levels of overall consumption growth. We actually had quite depressed mm -hmm. levels of overall consumption growth. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that when we're talking about consumption, what we're really trying to get at is how many units is the economy consuming or moving or producing? If you think about a widget, or let's just use the example of a car, uh, how many cars is the economy consuming, producing, transporting? That's really what drives. It's the number. So if you're producing or consuming uh, 10 cars, and then you're mm -hmm. uh, uh, producing or consuming 20 cars the next year, you need more employees in the factory, you need more transportation workers, um, you need a whole uh, bunch more of these multiplier effects to facilitate that consumption. And mm -hmm. if you concentrate the wealth in a very few uh, hands, uh, there's only so many cars that one person can produce. Now, at this stage, people may think that I'm arguing for redistributive type policies. It's actually entirely the opposite. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel or all of the works that I've done, um, I actually advocate and, and emphasize that most of these problems are, are linked to increasing government size, uh, not decreasing government size. So I am much more in favor of free market uh, type policies uh, I believe that those have the support of the academic research. I'm just articulating the side effects of the policies mm -hmm. that we've chosen and how it's caused negative consequences. I'm not saying that we should redistribute wealth or, or anything like that. Got it. And have you done research yourself in determining why the wealth effect fails? I know for myself, mm -hmm. like you have your brokerage account with your stocks and whatever in there, but it's almost detached from you. Like it doesn't really feel real. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, that's my retirement account. Right. Right. But right. as far exactly as like your right. actual, yeah, as far as your actual checking account, you're like, okay, yeah. this is the money I get to spend. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we've seen this proven out in research a, 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 a bunch of times. And what the research shows is that, uh, you know, they've, they've done this research for gambling, right? A hundred dollar win in gambling doesn't feel as good as a one hundred dollar loss feels bad, right? So yeah. if your asset prices or your stock portfolio is going up, you may not really consume all that much more because for the most part, unless you're a very uh, unique individual, not many people are borrowing against their stock portfolio to consume. It's just kind of like you said, it's passive, it goes up, you watch it. However, if your stock portfolio went down 40 or 50 percent, you would consume less because it would yeah, make yeah. you feel less wealthy. So the wealth effect does actually work in the negative direction. Hmm. It works slightly in the positive direction. But, you know, increasing asset prices 100 percent has a small benefit. Increasing them three, four, five, six hundred percent doesn't have much more benefit than that initial little boost. And that little boost is just because it's better than them declining. The decline right. is what causes the negative wealth effect. The increase only causes a very, very small positive effect. Right. And you mentioned previously that on your channel, you talk about, you know, the byproduct of what we're experiencing as far as the erosion of the middle class is potentially due to bigger government, not smaller government. So what would you... If, you know, we could wave a magic wand here and make uh, Eric, you know, head of Fed policy and, you know, ruler of America, what would you do and implement to kind of solve this conundrum we're in? So there's really solid academic research that shows that um, for every 10% uh, the government grows in terms of size. So let's say the government, let's, let's make it up. Let's say the government is 10% of the economy. If you go from 10% to 20%, every 10% increase in government size, it tends to reduce real economic growth 
by about 0.5% to 1.0%. Now, the research does say that there is an initial benefit. So when you go from 0% government to 5% or 10%, there is an initial boost because you uh, consolidate some resources, you get some efficiencies by, by having some sort of consolidation. But then when you start to get to the more advanced stages like the United States and all of the other major developed nations are, you start to cross this threshold where every 10 percentage point increase that you have, uh, it reduces uh, overall economic growth. And I have a lot of videos that explain the mechanisms as to why. Um, but in the uh, early 1900s, 1900s, 1910s, in the late 1800s, let's say, uh, government size as measured by government spending as a percentage of GDP, which is the most objective way we can do this, um, the government was about 12 to 15 percent of uh, the economy back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and real per capita growth was averaging about two and a half to three percent. Um, over the years, uh, the government incre increased in size uh, through the 60s, 70s and 80s, where it increased to about 25 percent. Um, we didn't see a huge negative in terms of the U.S. economic growth rate as we climbed from that 12 to 15 percent range to the 20 to 25 percent range. But over the last, let's say, uh, 40 years from the 1980s until now, we've gone from about 25 percent to almost 40 percent. And we have seen a dramatic change in the economy's trend rate of growth. Um, from the 1980s, we were growing about uh, 2 to 2.25 percent per annum uh, in real per capita terms. That's essentially the standard of living. Uh, now, over the last 20 years, it's only grown at about 1.1 percent. So we've lost 50 percent of our trend rate of growth as we've increased the government size from 25 percent to something closer to 40 percent, uh, specifically with um, a lot of the policies that we took on during the COVID period. So um, mm -hmm. I think the evidence is overwhelmingly clear that when you move beyond uh, 25%, certainly beyond 30%, uh, the consequences start to, to get very uh, meaningful for the economy. Mm -hmm. So if I uh, had a magic wand, um, I wouldn't um, try and dictate policies all that specifically, especially areas that I'm not... Uh, uh, an expert in, but I would say that we would need to uh, have some limiters that cap uh, the size that government can grow to. Uh, you can have some exceptions for war and and short term type things where the government may need to play a, a role, uh, but those policies would have to be reversed quickly, and you'd have to uh, keep the size of government in check. Now we can have. Um, societal debates about how we want to allocate that 25%. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the size limit should be there. Um, and I don't want to say that I have the answer to this. We could say that, you know, 23% is the right size. Uh, yeah. But I think that across many different countries, across several hundred years of history, we can gather some reasonable range that 20 to 25% uh, tends to be a range that may have some societal benefits in terms of smoothing the ends of the extremes on the business cycle and um, other uh, safety nets that, that are desirable in modern economies uh, mm -hmm. without having uh, as much of the negative external consequences. And the sad reality for the U.S. and all of the other major nations is it's, uh, it's a conversation that's, that's completely irrelevant unless you're willing to address or reform the, uh, the major entitlement programs. So we, mm -hmm. we may be uh, shouting into, a, uh, into, into the abyss here, but that's the crux of the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if we look at societies throughout history, they, they had populations, obviously, and they would have been increasing uh, for hopefully most of their lineage. And then there's probably, it probably ebbed and flowed, right? Like populations would naturally mm -hmm. on kind of a wave. Should we have, should policymakers should have, they just let the 
population ebb and flow and allow economic activity to ebb and flow with it? Or was the intervention warranted? So I think that that the birth rate is the ultimate uh, confidence indicator or the ultimate barometer of um, people's feelings about the economy and the future. So people who are having significantly less kids, uh, for the most part, are doing so because collectively we're less optimistic about our current environment and our ability to earn uh, an income and, and, and grow in the future. So I, I do think that the goal um, should be to maximize uh, uh, economic growth or maximize the increase in the standard of living. That will take care of the demographic problem. And a large answer to maximizing economic growth from the government side is, is really um, stepping out of the way and providing some services that are uh, beneficial uh, within size limits that are not overly bearing on the ability of the private sector to, uh, to generate that increase in the standard of living because the investment and production on the private side of the economy is what drives um, the increase in the standard of living. So I would say that the goal should be to maximize growth and that'll take care of the demographic problem. The interventions um, always tend to have unintended consequences. Right. So overall, and I would say I'm, I'm generally not in favor of, of interventionist type policies. Okay. And if we study history, what happens to societies as the middle class becomes a smaller and smaller portion of the total population? <clears throat> Well, I think I think at this point we we may be wandering slightly outside of my wheelhouse because it does tend to morph into political issues mm -hmm. um, as the um, as the standard of living or the growth rate in the standard of living deteriorates. So I think an important concept is that if you look at real per capita GDP growth, that is the best approximation of the standard of living for the country. So if real GDP per capita is three percent. That means on average, everybody's standard of living is going up 3% per year after inflation. So a genuine 3% increase in your standard of living. Now, we know that it's not equally distributed. There are bands around that 3%. So let's say some people are, are achieving a 1% increase and some people are achieving a 5% increase. But mm -hmm. if the average is, is getting pulled up, then uh, most of the population has an improvement in their standard of living, even if it's maybe only a 1% increase. The, the really um, deleterious uh, uh, effect of the growth rate moving down is that as the, the real per capita GDP growth has fallen from 3% to 2% to 1%, if we draw those same bands, we now have some people that are negative one or negative two, while other people are positive three and positive four. And as a society or just as an individual, it's very, very difficult to have your standard of living declining uh, and, and moving backwards. It tends to lead to uh, lots of societal unrest because it's a very difficult situation. And you're certainly not going to start a family and have kids if your own situation is getting worse every single year. Um, and because the growth rate of the economy has been pushed so low or the long term trend rate of growth, only about one percent. And we mm -hmm. also know that there's a lot of skew in there. Uh, yeah. We don't have great data on this, but my fear is that we're starting to push a larger and larger percentage potentially even more than 50% of the population to the point where their standard of living is actually going down each and every year. Uh, yeah. And that is very problematic. Uh, it doesn't genuinely lead to good things. Uh, where it kind of spirals from there, you kind of have a fork in the road and it really does ultimately end up being a political, uh, a political problem. Um, and, and there's obviously a lot of ways that that can go. We don't have to go through yeah. all the historical examples, but we know, <laughs> we know the few standouts. But that's really a – it's a sad situation. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a frustrating situation. It's an angering situation. But we know just based on the pure mathematics of it is that if the – over the last 20 years, if the average 
per capita growth rate has been about 1%. We just know by facts that there's a very significant portion of the population that's been below 1%, probably below zero. And it's very difficult uh, on the society when, when a very large percentage of the population is having a decline in the standard of living. And this is why demographics I find so fascinating because I find like, society and just news and everything. It's so noisy right now. And we get so distracted by the little things going on, but we have this massive demographic problem that's probably causing a lot of the challenges that we're experiencing. But because we're so distracted by everything else going on, we're not having these conversations to say, hey, you know, how can we take a few steps back here and look at the macro and then put together a plan about how to get birth mm-hmm. rates and improve the demographic situation for everybody so everybody's standard of living increases. So right. that's why I find well, this stuff so fascinating. Well, maybe, Ryan, you should be in charge because that's a very thoughtful yeah, way right. of looking at it. I think my fear is that there are people who have looked at the situation and the magnitude of the reforms that are needed and the short-term uh, difficulties of some of those reforms, I fear are just so great that most people aren't even willing to discuss them. Uh, and if that's the case, which it seems like it is, then we're just going to continue compounding the problem until it sort of brings itself to the forefront. Um, which is anybody's guess in terms of number of years. I mean, we could be talking about three years, five years, or 15 years. We really we really don't know just because of how slow these things move, but there's not a huge desire to, uh, to address any of these issues. Um, yeah. Because when you get to the root of it, like we said, the demographic picture is already set in stone. Even if we enacted the best policies today, um, it would be really difficult to over, to reverse it. We could do immigration type things. That's that's one swing factor. Uh, mm-hmm. But in the absence of that, it's very difficult. And uh, it really does force you uh, to look at the uh, major entitlement programs, which nobody wants to go near. So that's kind of where we're at with that. Right, right. Which <laughs> is so crazy because you think about the cost of not doing anything. And it's like, ah, you know, if you're a 70 year old politician or something, you'll be long gone. Right. So it's kind of not right. a problem, but hopefully they're not having yeah. that sort of an outlook, but. Uh, right. Stan Druckenmiller has made a lot of noise on this topic as someone who, um, at least in my opinion, seems pretty genuine in his desire to correct the problem for future generations. Um, and he basically said exactly what you said, which is, um, you know, when you look at the entitlement programs, you can, have everybody get you know eighty five cents on the dollar today, or or fifty cents on the dollar fifteen years from now if you want to delay it hmm. that long. So, yeah. you know, it's just like really anything else in life, which is um, you know short term pain, long term gain. Um, yeah. The longer you delay it, the worse it usually is. So, uh, um, you know, if you haven't listened to the Stan Druckenmiller take, I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, he has a pretty uh, uh, detailed take in terms of, you know, when these problems may uh, move more forcefully to the forefront. And I think a lot of that depends on um, the magnitude of uh, any downturn in the economy over the next year or two, because recessions tend to pull forward a lot of these fiscal problems if tax revenues decline pretty significantly. Right. And we've touched on entitlements a couple times. And I know this could be a three hour show in itself, just talking about (laughs) entitlement. But could you give us maybe a quick recap about the entitlement situation and what the forecast looks like moving forward? Right. So the major programs are are Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. But we actually have quite a large variety of um, entitlement programs in the United States. And again, I have nothing against the entitlement programs. Um, I, you know, as I was mentioning that As long as we as a society agree how we want to allocate these resources, if we had, you know, 20, 25 percent of the economy was the government and we as a society wanted to have a strong social safety net within those constraints, I'd be I'd be all for that. Um, Mm -hmm. But we have to recognize that these programs have grown in in incredible size. Um, And because of this very lopsided dynamic that's developing in the population, we're going to start having people that are. Uh, demanding money or or receiving money from these programs, um, and we're not really able to generate the tax revenue to uh, support all of the people that are pulling money from them, unless uh, we decide to increase taxes in various ways, which is 
another possible way that we could we could deal with this problem. There's some combination mm -hmm. of spending cuts and tax increases. But again, of course, that's going to have some negative consequences on the economy, less disposable income for, for most people. But yeah. the, the, the crux of the issue is we have Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, most of these programs are, are, are delivered to people who are 65 and older. Um, they certainly have paid into these programs over the years. They're certainly entitled by law to receive all of this money. Um, mm -hmm. But because uh, over the years we haven't um, kept these trusts, as they call them, um, as properly funded as we should have, uh, mm -hmm. now we're, we're running into shortfalls. And by most projections, if we run the programs as they are right now with no recessions, somewhere seven to nine years from now, these programs will be insolvent, meaning that people will be forced to take cuts in the amount of money that they're receiving. Um, mm -hmm. A recession would, would pull that forward from seven to nine years to I don't know maybe three to five. It really depends on wow. um, how, how big the recession is and how much tax revenues fall. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the general issue with the programs. And it's it's just that these um, society-based entitlement programs are only really functional when the population dynamics are, um, you know, more optimally uh, distributed. When you get this very lopsided older population to younger population, they tend to be very stressful on these uh, social safety net type programs. And that's the mm -hmm. issue that we're facing today. The second point that I would really like to stress on all of these entitlement programs, because when we talk about this, a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction is the government's going to inflate the problem away, right? Or they're going to print money to uh, pay for these things. But an entitlement program isn't really worth anything unless it's indexed to inflation. Because mm -hmm. if you're 65 and you start receiving Social Security and you're still alive at 95, uh, if that's not indexed to inflation, you're going to have a reduction in your Social Security check in real terms of 50 or 60 percent, perhaps. Yeah. So all of these entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, you name it, military type pensions, government pensions, all of them are implicitly or explicitly uh, uh, linked to certain parts of the CPI. So you know, uh, various uh, food related entitlement programs are linked to the food component in the in the CPI. All of this makes yeah. sense yeah. if you're crafting an entitlement program. But unless the government goes in and breaks the links to those entitlement programs, which renders the whole program useless uh, or, again, just restructures the program, you can't mm -hmm. inflate your way out of these problems, which is right. why we've had. 40 year highs in inflation over the last 18 months, but we haven't really done uh, all that much or basically nothing in terms of um, reducing any of these any of these debt burdens. They've actually only gotten worse despite the inflation. So we've learned that running inflation really high, all it does is it devastates the people that you're proposing will be helped by inflating the debt away. It's hurting mm -hmm. the same people that the debt hurt. Um, so it's very frustrating. Um, you know, we, we really need to think about this in, in more uh, serious ways because having a society that's very over indebted really hurts wage earners, which are the middle class. And then trying mm -hmm. to solve that indebtedness problem through inflation hurts the same people that you hurt by taking on the debt. Um, and, and because we've linked all of these programs by necessity to inflation, Solving mm -hmm. them through uh, an inflationary process is is basically impossible. Very interesting. And I know growing up, I was in university and I was listening to Peter Schiff back in the day, and I still do actually. And he was always saying that entitlement programs, they're not solvent, so don't expect to get any money from the government when you retire. If you're a new entry into the workforce, and maybe you're working for a government where you have a defined benefit plan, meaning that they're going to guarantee X amount of income adjusted for inflation every year in retirement, would you, t would you recommend that those people maybe not bank on that retirement <clears throat> income being guaranteed as much as you think it is? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. I guess I would, I would answer it from my shoes. I would say I have <clears throat> a good 30 years until I'm eligible for, for these programs. I wouldn't be banking on um, the programs being constructed in the same way that they are now. Uh, right. I guess that's the way that, that I would phrase it. Um, 
the math, uh, look, if you're going to receive the programs in the next five years or the next 10 years, it's really hard to say. It depends how long we kick this can down the road. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I would say if you're 20 years away, 30 years away, it, it seems mathematically impossible that the programs are in the same form as they are today. Um, you know, are they still there at all? I mean, probably, probably I, I would assume. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that I'm not personally banking on those programs being there when, yeah. when I'm of age. Right. Right. <laughs> and as we wrap this up here, I got two more questions for you. And the first one is over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years, how do you think this plays out knowing the backdrop that uh, you've made our audience aware of and all the research you do? So my my overall um, view on, on where this is heading is that it'll become increasingly difficult for um, politicians to um, continuously go down the road that they've gone down, specifically after the experience that we've had during COVID. When people were getting the stimulus checks, I'm not sure exactly what you guys did over in Canada, but people are familiar with what we did here in the US. And while yeah. people were receiving these checks, it was great. We all loved it. Um, but now we are all experiencing the nasty side effects, the inflation and the erosion of the standard of living. And I think most people and even most politicians have become aware that that uh, has made people worse off and more angry. So I think the bar to do COVID-like stimulus again will be very high. Um, I would be very surprised if we do something um, as akin to a helicopter drop as we did during the COVID period. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the absence of really um, acute and aggressive fiscal injections, I'm not talking about the run of the mill entitlement spending. I'm really talking about the very direct, abrupt injections of fiscal stimulus to the extent that those don't come to the same extent that we saw during COVID. My overall view over the next 10, 20 years is that the growth rate of the economy will continue to grind down and down and down. We're, we've, we've fallen from three to two to one. It's hard to it's hard to envision, but we will continue to grind towards 0.5 and zero. That's going to push more and more people below that zero bound. It's going to cause more frictions within uh, the societies. And uh, I think it will become increasingly difficult um, to support asset prices uh, the way that they're doing it now. Um, So I I view the path forward. Uh, as one of more anemic growth and one of um, more uh, deflationary type tendencies over the long run, just because of the structural forces that are in place, with Mm -hmm. the caveat that if we see um, helicopter drop like stimulus again, then we've clearly demonstrated that that will cause uh, short term and potentially very aggressive bouts of inflation. Um, mm-hmm. So it's not a overly optimistic view. And I, again, would remind everyone that with these demographic trends, we're really talking about five-year, 10-year, 15-year trend rates of growth. So um, as, as sad, sad as it is to say, I would say that the, uh, the next 10 or 15 years will look uh, something like the last 10 or 15 years in terms of the difficulties experienced by a majority of the people um, operating under the assumption that we go down um, somewhat of a similar path uh, or, or at least don't change the trajectory of where we're heading. Right. So based on that and the demographic headwinds that you've described, it sounds like inflation is really cool. something that is going to get worked out of the system relatively you know, in the near future and Mm -hmm. growth is going to be relatively um, low. So if you were going to design a portfolio or find a way to, you know, still make money and generate investment returns during this time period, it really sounds like technology should outperform similarly to how it did over the past 10 years. If it's finding growth in a no growth Mm -hmm. kind of world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think it's a coincidence that 
the technology stocks dominated so aggressively in the environment that I described of the last 10 years and potentially over the next 10 years, because if you think about most of the stocks that are not technology, maybe your industrials, your banks, um, your stocks that are much more tied to the actual economy, producing things, um, moving things throughout the economy, those stocks did not perform overly well over the last 10 or 15 years. It really came from the domination of the technology stocks because when uh, growth is so weak, investors uh, tend to pay a lot for growth that they can find. So uh, if the economy continues to go down this road of weaker and weaker rates of growth, that same distribution that we are talking about for the population should also play out in the corporate world, which is um, if you're a company that's very tied to the actual economy, um, moving things, building things, um, you know, producing things, uh, it's, it, it's going to be increasingly difficult for you to compete with some of the companies like uh, the more maybe innovative technology companies that are able to raise money cheaply because they have future prospects and, and mm -hmm. uh, good stories behind them. But it's, I think it's been proven over the last 15 or 20 years that when growth is scarce, people pay a premium for the growth that does exist. And the perception is that that growth is in the technology sector. Right. And is there anything that could happen in the future that would somehow shake us out of this demogra demographic decline and that would cause you to rethink your thesis here? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. One is um, you could have a change in immigration, right? And that's something that could affect a country on an individual level, but mm -hmm. it's zero sum in the sense that we'd be taking the population from somewhere else. So if we looked at the yeah. global population, that's still a problem, but you mm -hmm. could have winners and losers if there are uh, aggressive immigration type policies. That's one thing that could change things. I'm not overly optimistic about that because um, all of the population projections that I use and, and most people look at assume various levels of immigration. And even if you take the aggressive immigration scenario, we're still basically mm -hmm. uh, on, on the same trends. Um, okay. I would say that um, there could be uh, newfound sources of income or radical changes in technology. So uh, I'll give you one example, which is uh, in the uh, California gold rush people discovered a lot of gold. And at the time, gold was money, right? Um, and I yeah, guess gold yeah. still is money. So um, people had this overnight step function increase in their incomes, which obviously reduced their debt burdens quite significantly. So that right. would clear our over or, or reduce our overall debt burdens. Um, is that going to happen? I don't know. I don't think so. But it could be something like finding um, instead of gold, like uh, mineral deposits or some advancement in technology that causes a huge uh, surplus in uh, maybe the availability of, of resources and minerals and, and things like that. Um, so I would say you could have radical advancements in technology. You could have newfound sources of income or resources, and you could potentially have some on the margin changes in immigration. But those what I would I would assume to be the the three most um, likely scenarios across history of solving a problem that otherwise is really difficult to solve again, just because of how uh, uh, how slow moving some of these these factors are. Right, and do you think AI could maybe be that piece to the puzzle here, as far mm -hmm. as unlocking a whole bunch of productivity that was maybe unable to be accessed prior to that. I know there's a lot of fear mongering about AI, but I personally think it could be this huge unlock for society and maybe improve productivity to the point where maybe we can actually pay off this debt over time. Yeah, it's it's certainly possible. I'm definitely not qualified to give that answer. One, one thing I would encourage everyone to keep in mind when um, thinking about these technological changes is that we have the difference between what we call evolutionary technology and revolutionary technology. So evolutionary technology would be like iPhone 1 to iPhone 10. There's no doubt that there's been a lot of technological improvements, but it's been evolutionary in nature. Um, uh, 
building a car was a revolutionary change because we went from horses to cars, right? But why was that so important? It's because that change increased the demand for what we call our factors of production, land, labor, and capital. So when we moved from the horse to the car, we also needed to build a uh, highway system, a road Mm -hmm. system. We needed rubber for tires. We needed metal and parts for these cars. We needed more demand for people to build these things. So that was a revolutionary change in technology that increased the demand for land, labor, and capital. Mm -hmm. So when we think about uh, changes in technology going forward, things that would be very helpful would be things that cause a revolutionary change that increases the need for land, labor, and capital. Um, Evolutionary changes don't tend to cause radical shifts in the need for land, labor, and capital, and therefore they tend to not be overly um, helpful for right. um, step function changes. You know, there was not a huge change from iPhone one to ten for society. A lot of cool apps, a lot of cool new features, but not hmm. the revolutionary type of change that caused you know a, a step function increase in the amount of oil that we were going to need forever when we moved from hor- uh, horse to car. You know, when we invented the plane, this obviously changed the amount of oil we would need forever. This changed, you know, a lot of various factors relating to land, labor and capital. So that's the change. That's what I would keep in mind with thinking about these technology changes. Could AI do it? I'm not qualified enough to answer, but it's definitely possible. (laughs) Yeah. No, this is awesome. And this is a fascinating conversation. I feel like I could talk to you all day, but I know you have a hard stop. So as we wrap up here, where can we send listeners to learn more about yourself and uh, what you're doing over at uh, EPB Macro? Yeah, great. Thank you. And um, definitely happy to do it uh, anytime. If, if people love these conversations, I'm happy to do it again. Um, in the meantime, you can search uh, EPB Research on YouTube. Uh, I got a lot of different videos that talks about these demographic trends, some of these real estate trends. Uh, and then you can go to epbresearch.com uh, and you can read uh, various blog posts that I have on the same topic uh, as well. So those would be the two best places I would say to follow me and all the new work that I'm doing. Right on, sir. Well, like I said, it was excellent to meet you. Very grateful to have you on the show here and thanks for making the time. Likewise. Thanks, Ryan.